This series contains adult language and descriptions of graphic violence throughout. Listener discretion is advised. Cavalry Audio. Nature's first green is gold, her hardest hue to hold, her early leaves a flower, but only so an hour. Then leaf subsides to leaf, so Eden sank to grief. So dawn goes down to day. Nothing gold can stay. This brief yet brilliant poem, again by the great Robert Frost, captures perhaps most succinctly his unparalleled interrogation of nature and the beauty, wonder, and timelessness he was able to find there. As with all truly great art, there have been several scholarly interpretations of this piece, some that focus on the depth of Frost's botanical knowledge of the woods of the northeastern United States, others that consider the biblical allegories present in the poem. But most seem to settle on the quiet and overwhelming sadness that consumes the reader, if they allow it to. It's a song often sung by poets, reminding us that it's later than we think and imploring us to seize the day. However, Frost, in his unflinching honesty and wisdom, boldly tells us that as sure as the dawn will yield to the coming day and ultimately the dark of night, as sure as that first green of spring will be forgotten in the creeping death of autumn, so too is our own time in the sun but a moment in the march of history. It is with this understanding that we must accept that the bright and fleeting dawn that was the life of Tommy Sullivan had begun its descent into darkness. From Cavalry Audio, I'm Brandon Morgan, and this is The Devil Within. You can run off for a long time, run for a long time, run on for a long time. This is episode eight. Nothing gold can stay. When Tommy awoke on the morning of December 23rd, he apparently had no knowledge of what happened the previous night in the woods of Clinton Road. According to Lance, Tommy had amnesia or maybe short-term memory loss. Tommy barely remembered even going to Clinton Road, let alone the incredible events that occurred. Instead, Tommy's thoughts were on the Christmas holiday, which was only two days away. However, instead of rising early and getting in his morning run, he lay in bed and allowed his mind to wander. He thought of the benevolent man from up above, who dressed kind of funny and had a long beard. This man also had some magical helpers who did his bidding, and he kept a list of everyone and decided who would be rewarded and who would be punished. For he was always watching, even while we slept. After all, it was nearly Christmas. This was the time of year that this man was celebrated all over the world. But, wait, who was it that Tommy was thinking about? Was it Santa Claus? Jesus? The descriptions were so similar that he became confused and nervously re-examined the development of his faith. He made a stark realization. His parents had introduced and reinforced his belief in Santa Claus his entire childhood, until in the second grade, Tommy had figured out that such a man couldn't be real. His parents relented and told him the truth, so long as he kept the secret and didn't ruin it for his little brother. This promise of adult-level secret-keeping was enough of a salve to soothe the years of lying. But then, just a few months later, Tommy reached a milestone event in the life of every Catholic, his first communion. The consumption of the Eucharist, transubstantiated blood and flesh of the Savior, marks the true acceptance of Jesus into the hearts of the faithful, and for Tommy it was no different. However, on this cold December morning, the memory gave Tommy a feeling of anger and frustration. He felt duped, hustled. His parents spent years building the infrastructure of belief in a powerful man who was always watching and had the ability to punish or reward. And as soon as that was exposed as a lie, the figure of the childhood God was replaced with the adult version. He had been programmed to believe. It was his default setting 
and that had been taken advantage of perfectly by a group of people whose only desire was to serve the sinister interests of... Whoa, whoa, whoa. <sighs> Tommy took a deep breath. He was sweating. His heart was racing. This wasn't him. He had never in his life taken a cynical stance on the church or its teachings. And for a boy his age, he had an evolved and sophisticated relationship with God. So where was all this nonsense coming from? This was the first sign that something was wrong. Something had invaded Tommy's thoughts. He was able, at least then, to control it and get his mind right. But we must assume that from that morning until his death 16 days later, Tommy wasn't always in control of Tommy. So what really happened the night of the winter solstice? Knowing what we do about the nature of the crimes Tommy would soon commit and the devastating transformation that would occur in the weeks leading up to it, we know that something happened. If we refer back to the grimoire found in Tommy's room, the same book that was saved from the fire by Michael Kennedy and placed into police evidence. I've helped put out the books that were on fire on the way in with Tom originally. Bart McConnelly, the cop, lights a bunch of people into the house after he has the house cleared. So everybody's sitting down looking at these satanic books that were set up in a circle in the living room. The same book that would be inspected by a young police officer who would go on to become mayor. Um, he had a picture book. He liked to draw. And you see, that you know, if you flip through the pages, you would see Mickey Mouse and cartoon characters. And as you flip through, now you're starting to see pentagrams and, you know, pictures of horned uh, men. And, 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 and all of a sudden, you, you see this transformation of he went from, from, from light to dark. That book proclaimed, in no uncertain terms, to allow the reader to summon a demon from a different plane of existence into our own. Tommy Sullivan, equal parts rebellious and adventurous, decided to give it a try. And although Tommy didn't believe it at the time, he succeeded. The result, as we now look at all the evidence through this new prism, is a cruel and terrifying battle for the soul of a boy who had no idea what he had unleashed, or more specifically, what he was about to unleash. But Tommy Sullivan wouldn't go quietly. The Christmas holiday passed without incident. It was, in fact, a wonderful time in the Sullivan household, filled with joy and presents and church and food and relatives in from Philly and a fresh blanket of snow on Christmas Eve, so everyone awoke to a storybook type of white Christmas. But for all the happiness in the air, it was ultimately tinged with a regretful melancholy. For this would be not only the last Christmas the Sullivans would enjoy as a family, it was also the final moments of lasting peace that the family would experience, ever. Although Tommy had been largely absent from wrestling practice for the previous 10 days, he was still allowed to compete in the winter tournament, owing to his dominance in his weight class to that point in the season. The tournament lasted for three days. It was single elimination, with the champion in each weight class needing to win seven matches. In four matches over the first two days of the tournament, Tommy scored first period pins in every one. He was unstoppable, wrestling like a man possessed. He seemed destined to take home the championship until midway through the second period of his semifinal match on day three. The 105 pound wrestler from Vernon Middle School was giving Tommy all he could handle. Tommy was down on points, and would need a pin to secure a victory. With about a minute to go in the second period, it seemed as though Tommy would be the one to get pinned. The other boy had him at a disadvantage, his weight securing Tommy's right shoulder to the mat while using his chin to dig into Tommy's left shoulder in an attempt to force that shoulder to the mat as well, thereby earning a pin. It was inevitable. Victory was moments away. Then something in Tommy snapped. By the sheer force of strength, Tommy avoided the pin and reversed on his opponent. But then he placed the boy from Vernon in an illegal armbar and didn't stop pulling until the boy's right elbow exploded. It was a sickening, devastating injury that left the crowd speechless. The demands of school, the demands of being competitive, sure, that could absolutely lead into something where somebody could absolutely snap. 
Eyewitness accounts claim that Tommy seemed disoriented and panicked in the immediate aftermath of the match, as if he didn't know where he was or how he got there. A report was filed with the school administrators, but the police were kept out of it. Perhaps if they'd been notified and decided to question Tommy, it might have led to a search of his bedroom. And if the police had searched his bedroom, they would have undoubtedly discovered evidence of Tommy's interest and involvement in Satanism and the occult. But they didn't. Tommy went home that night, and as his parents struggled with a restless night of worried sleep, he added to his grimoire. On December 28th, Tommy made his first mention of voices in his head. Only they weren't voices exactly. Tommy described them as feelings, feelings that weren't his own and that were making his mind go to strange and ugly places. He would be dead in 11 days. Those remarkable handful of minutes on the wrestling mat would be Tommy's last as a competitive athlete. He was kicked off the team and suspended from all sports for the remainder of the year. But he was allowed back in school. And it's there that we discover the next clue that something terrible was happening to Tommy. The world is opening back up, everybody. Where are you going this summer? Why not get the most out of your vacation by learning the language of the country you're going to travel to with Babbel, the number one selling language learning app. Everything from asking for directions to the museum, to ordering your favorite food, to also gaining a deeper understanding of the culture of the country that you're visiting. I got my eye on the big prize. I chose Italian. That's where my wife's from. I'm going to be taking the family there next year, and I want to be able to impress everybody with how awesome I am at speaking Italian. Babbel lessons were created with practical, real-world conversations in mind, things you're going to use in everyday life. Babbel's lessons were created by over 100 different language experts chiming in together. And as a result, their teaching method has been scientifically proven to be effective. And there are so many ways to learn with Babbel. In addition to the lessons, you can access podcasts, games, videos, stories, and even live classes. And right now, when you purchase a three-month Babbel subscription, you'll get an additional three months for free. That's six months for the price of three. Just go to Babbel.com and use the promo code WITHIN. That's B-A-B-B-E-L dot com code WITHIN for an extra three months free. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. As you all know by now, I'm a big fan of therapy, have been my entire adult life. What I love most about BetterHelp is that they are committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches. BetterHelp's greatest strength is the quality of the therapists that work with them. And to really help that point land, I want to read a couple of reviews from their website. These are real reviews from actual BetterHelp customers. Dr. Mitchell is great. He has been a great help the last few weeks. I would refer him to my friends and family because he takes pride in being the best therapist he can be. Very knowledgeable and easy to talk to. Or this one. Linda is very professional and at the same time relatable and puts me at ease to open up and discuss my issues. The sound advice provided as well as the worksheets are very helpful to me. After my sessions with Linda, I feel as though a load has been lifted. I feel lighter and also a sense of relief. So visit betterhelp.com slash devil within that's better H E L P and join the over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. In fact, so many people have been using better help that they are recruiting additional counselors in all 50 States special offer for the devil within listeners. Get 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash devil within. The first day of school after Christmas break was Monday, January 4th, 1988. The day started normally for Tommy. Homeroom, first period, social studies, second period, algebra two. But then in between classes, he stopped in the boys' room to relieve himself. Without Tommy's knowledge, Lance had been closely following him all morning, and when Tommy went to the sink to wash his hands, he saw Lance, in the mirror's reflection, standing right behind him. It's unclear exactly what Lance said to Tommy, but it was something to the effect of, I know what's happening to you. For reasons unknown, Tommy quickly turned on his friend, grabbed a pencil from his backpack, and stabbed Lance in his right temple, driving the pencil several inches into his brain. 
Tommy then proceeded to tear the electric hand dryer off the wall and savagely beat Lance with it. Mr. Sullivan, Mr. Sullivan, Tommy. Tommy woke with a start in Mr. Cavanaugh's classroom. The rest of his history class laughed at the puddle of drool that had formed on his desk during his unauthorized nap. Except Lance. He wasn't laughing at all. He was worried about his friend. More than anyone else, Lance was witnessing the change happening to Tommy, for he had spent more time with Tommy over the previous month than anybody. Tommy was, again, disoriented and confused. He was exhausted. His eyes were red and sunken. As soon as Mr. Cavanaugh got a good look at him, Tommy was dismissed and told to report to the nurse's office. Instead, Tommy went home. His records show a cut for the rest of his classes that day. A cut simply refers to an unexcused absence from one or more classes. There would be several more cuts on Tommy's record over the next four days. On Wednesday, January 6th, Tommy had another violent dream that seemed all too real. He was back in the woods of Clinton Road, near the ruins of Cross Castle, when he surprised a group of Satanists in the middle of a black mass and brutally murdered the leader. In the dream, Tommy smashed the man's head with a large rock he had broken loose from a castle wall. As soon as the others from the group descended on Tommy to exact their revenge, Tommy woke up in his bed at home. He was covered in sweat. His sheets were soaked through, and he felt like he was going to throw up. He stumbled out of bed and into the bathroom. As soon as he turned on the light, he looked in the mirror and cried out in horror. The face looking back wasn't his. It was the face of a demon. The scream from the bathroom woke his parents and sent his mother racing down the hall to check on her son. Tommy, scared that his mother, or anyone else for that matter, would see the hideous beast he had become, slammed the door in his mother's face with such force that one of the hinges broke loose. By this point, Tommy's father had gotten out of bed and joined his wife outside the bathroom door. When Mr. Sullivan forced the door open, he found only his scared and crying son, pitiful in his vulnerability, reaching out for help. No ghastly demon snarling in the dark, no rage-fueled rebel itching for a fight, just their son, obviously troubled and in need. But when pressed for answers, he shut down, offering his parents only the most cliched responses to their admittedly cliched questions of concern. What's going on with you? Answer, you wouldn't understand. Will you let us help you? Answer, you can't help me. No one can help me. Tommy walked away and collapsed in his bed. The next two days of school seemed to pass without any major incidents. At least none were officially reported. But the last two days of school that week, Tommy skipped entirely. No one knows for sure where he spent his time, but it was those absences that sparked the argument with his mother on Saturday night. There were a few vague reports that placed Tommy at the church on Friday morning and again early Saturday evening. His family assumed that he had been spending time at Lance's house, though Tommy never specifically said so. It's not like Tommy was missing or had run away from home, and maybe his parents had given him a little too much slack with regard to his time away, but parenting was different back then. However, given the recent events in Tommy's life, you'd think his parents would have been more attentive, not less. Maybe they were afraid of pushing too hard and alienating an already and suddenly sensitive child. Maybe they were afraid he'd shut down completely and refuse any help at all. Maybe they were afraid he actually would run away. One thing is clear. They were afraid of the wrong thing. They should never have let Tommy back in the house. On the evening of Saturday, January 9th, Tommy got home well after dark. His father, who had been sick the previous few days, had been asleep for hours. His little brother, Brian, was also sleeping soundly. His mother was waiting up, hoping to have a heart-to-heart -heart with her son. She wanted to get him back on track before he strayed too far from his life of church, school, and athletics. She would be firm if she had to. But Tommy just walked right past her, ignoring her warm welcome, followed by an invitation to talk. He didn't even register her protestations and growing anger as she demanded he stop and listen to his mother. 
He never stopped walking until he got to his bedroom, went inside, and fell almost instantly asleep. Tommy awoke what seemed an instant later, again sweaty and out of breath, again trying to process a terrible and violent dream. This time it concerned his mother. In his dream, he had attacked her, bludgeoned her with a dumbbell and then stabbed her repeatedly with his small Boy Scout knife. In his dream, he felt as though he wasn't in control of his body or his thoughts, that he was merely a vessel being commanded by a simmering beast that lay just below the surface. And he didn't mean that metaphorically. He felt as though something was inside of him, growing stronger, waiting to escape from his body. He remembered his dream in flashes of violence, his mother's skull caving in, the occasional resistance his blade would meet when it struck bone, the geysers of blood, and his strength. He remembered that he had somehow lifted his mother's body above his head and hurled it against the far wall of the family room, nearly hitting the ceiling. That detail alone assured him that it was just another of his grotesque dreams. A boy his size couldn't possibly perform such a feat of strength. Tommy lay motionless, catching his breath. He listened closely, straining his ears for any sound in the house. He wanted to get a drink of water in the bathroom, but didn't want to risk seeing either of his parents. Satisfied that the house was asleep, Tommy walked down the hall in the dark until he reached the bathroom. He closed the door behind him and turned on the light. What he saw in the mirror shook him to his core. It wasn't the face of the demon that had visited him so often of late. It was his own face, to be sure, only it was covered in blood. And so was the rest of him. He slowly reached into the front pocket of his jeans, terrified at what he might find, praying to find anything, anything other than what he suddenly knew would be there. His Boy Scout knife. He looked at the weapon in his hand, sticky with dried blood, and he knew what must be awaiting discovery in the downstairs family room. When Tommy reached the bottom step, he hesitated a moment before turning on the light, as if giving himself a chance to wake up. But that relief wasn't to be. In the soft overhead light of the family room, he took in the grisly scene. Blood everywhere, the dumbbell in the middle of the floor, his own footprints in the various pools of blood, and his mother's mangled corpse in a heap against the far wall. Fighting the urge to retch, Tommy raced up the stairs and went back to his bedroom. He was looking for something, something else from his dream, a small detail that suddenly seemed of vital importance. Had he written something? The memory was gray, but it was slowly coming back. Once in his room, he turned on his light and instantly saw what he was looking for. There, on his desk, written in his own sloppy handwriting, was a simple document. A contract. It appeared to be a deal between himself and the great demon of hell. And the contract called for the murder of his entire family, including himself. For the moment, Tommy was able to grasp what was going on, even if he didn't quite believe it. The grimoire was right. Richard Cross had figured out an ancient secret. The ritual at the castle had been successful. A demon was growing within him. He glanced at the contract again. His entire family. Tommy raced to the bathroom and began cleaning all the blood off him. Moments later, he heard the bathroom doorknob turning. His brother, Brian, appeared squinting in the light. Though half asleep, Brian noticed the remaining blood on his brother's hands. Are you okay, Tommy? He asked. I'm fine, Tommy replied. I just cut my hand and mommy's taking me to the hospital. Go back to bed. When Tommy looked in the mirror, he saw the demon looking back. It was here, and it wanted Brian. The thoughts flooding Tommy's brain were of violence and bloodshed. It was all he could do to shut the door, to not follow his sweet young brother down the hall and kill him in his bedroom. The resistance was excruciating and blinding. It was fire and darkness and burning and nearly impossible. When Tommy came to, he found that he was meticulously placing his grimoire, his copy of the Satanic Bible, and all of his other books on the occult and Satanism in a circle on the living room floor. He wasn't sure how much time had passed, but it was still dark outside. 
He quickly got his bearings, remembered the gruesome scene downstairs, and his blood ran cold. Had he fulfilled the contract? Were his father and brother lying in pools of blood somewhere in the house? A quick search of their bedrooms found them sleeping peacefully, and a wave of relief swept over Tommy. But now what? The next time whatever it was that lay lurking beneath the surface of his psyche took over, he may lack the power to resist it. Tommy returned to the living room and saw the source of his grief, of his ultimate and inevitable undoing. Richard Cross's grimoire. Tommy knew the only way to prevent the chaos he had created from happening again was to destroy that book. He went into the kitchen and found a book of matches which he used to ignite the ancient pages in Cross's book as well as the other books laid out on the living room floor. Then Tommy grabbed his father's car keys and headed out the front door. He needed to get as far away from his family as possible, for their own safety. As he carefully navigated the snowy front steps, Tommy was momentarily distracted by the sound of the smoke alarm going off in his house. At least that'll wake him up, he reassured himself as he climbed into his father's car and started the engine. But as he started backing up, his world started to blur. His reflection in the rearview mirror became a horrible, sneering visage with flaming red eyes that illuminated the car's interior. Then, an unseen force slammed his foot down on the accelerator and jerked the steering wheel hard to the right, sending the car careening across White Rock Boulevard and smashing into a snowbank in the driveway of the house across the street. When Tommy woke up, he was cold and shivering, and all was silence. If he stayed completely still, He could hear the soft patter of snowflakes landing on the virgin snow that surrounded him. But where was he? The last thing he remembered was backing out of his driveway in his father's car. Then the piercing wail of a siren grabbed his attention and he looked to his right. And there, clearly through the woods and across the street, he could see his own house eerily aglow in the rhythmic flashing of police and fire engine lights. He immediately discerned that he was in the backyard of his across-the-street neighbor, the Eastmans. If he had awoken 30 minutes earlier, he might have seen a group of nervous, rambunctious men in their early 20s exiting his house. They weren't law enforcement, they weren't firefighters, or even members of the press. They just happened to be attending a party at the Eastmans and heard there was a situation at the Sullivan house. Before the police could secure the scene, Mr. Sullivan had asked if anyone would help put the fire out in his living room and help him look for the rest of his family. There were books on the floor that were on fire. Um, We started stamping it all out. It was during the small window of opportunity that we get the information that shapes the bulk of our story. It is believed that several of the books, including the Cross Grimoire, were taken as macabre souvenirs. The cop lights a bunch of people into the house. So everybody's sitting down looking at these satanic books. And a couple other guys from the party ended up across the street walking through the house. I think they overheard what was going on and just being nosy and and went over. Although never officially verified, Cross's original manuscript is thought to exist in a private collection somewhere in the Northeast. From this vantage point, Tommy could see everything. The house he grew up in, his bedroom window, neighbors gathered in the street, the coroner removing his mother's body, while his father broke down and cried beside the ambulance. And when he saw his little brother being escorted by a police detective to a waiting cruiser, Tommy again felt a wave of relief. He had done it. He had been able to spare the lives of his father and brother, at least for now. He wanted to run to them, to apologize, to try and explain what had happened, although he knew no one would ever believe him. It was then that Tommy realized that he could no longer move. At all. It was as though he were frozen to the spot. It began slowly at first. His right hand moved without his consent. It was reaching into his pocket. Tommy tried to stop it, but simply could not. He couldn't even move his head to look down at what was happening, but he knew. His Boy Scout knife was in his right pocket and was surely now in his right hand. The bloody knife briefly passed through his field of vision as it met his left hand and was opened with a click. Slowly his own hand, wielding his own knife, was raised into the air in front of him and then turned and pointed back at himself, at his neck. Tommy knew what was to follow and was powerless to stop it. And yet somewhere, 
somewhere from the deepest reserves of desire and instinct and species survival, Tommy was able to summon his last bits of consciousness to claim what dominion he could over his own body. And as the knife was suddenly thrust towards his neck, Tommy raised his left arm in a defensive posture and intercepted the knife before it could find its target. The pain was excruciating. Tommy could feel the blade as it slid between the bones of his arm, severing muscle and tendon and nerve. Then his right hand drew back and again, against his own will, thrust the knife toward his throat. Again, Tommy was able to deflect the blow, but not as completely as the first time, for he was beginning to lose the battle to the evil that had grown within him. The knife slashed through his arm and penetrated the side of his neck, nicking the artery and sending out into the pristine snow a fine spray of steaming blood. His right hand drew back one last time, and Tommy knew this was the end. His world was beginning to go out of focus. There was no longer any pain coming from the terrible wounds to his left wrist. He no longer felt cold. When he saw the flash of the blade for the last time as it sped toward him, he braced himself for the pain that never came. No pain. Although he could hear the sounds of his own death as the small knife cut its ragged path across his neck, destroying completely everything in its way. What Tommy found curious was that although he was unable to move a single muscle in his body, his view of the world suddenly changed. No longer was he looking through the woods at his childhood home. He was now, somehow, looking straight up at the sky as his life drained from his body, unable to blink as snowflakes fell in his eyes. Moments later, without a soul to witness the event, a demon was born into the world. Delivered as promised through a breach in the mortal conduit that summoned it into our plane of existence. Struggling up through the mutilated gore that used to be the body of Tommy Sullivan until it could finally climb out from the gaping hole it had created in Tommy's neck. Then it launched into the air and lit on a high branch of a walnut tree where it could at last become fully realized. Standing to full height on its powerful legs with cloven hooves, its tail unfurled, then it spread its leathery wings and with a menacing screech to announce its presence, launched itself into the January night and flew away to once again terrorize the woods and add to the legend of the Jersey Devil. Then leaf subsides to leaf, so Eden sank to grief, so dawn goes down to day, nothing gold can stay. Coming up on the next episode of The Devil Within. I come to a traffic signal, not a stoplight, just a blinking light at the corner of Schoolhouse and Ridge Road, and I turn right. Less than a quarter mile, I slow down to turn into the neighborhood called White Rock. And it isn't long before I come to a stop in front of a gray, one-story home with a sloping front lawn and a Toyota in the driveway. This is where it happened. This is the quiet, peaceful home that was visited by unspeakable evil on a snowy night in January of 1988. And unfortunately, that wasn't the end of the story for this town, for the street, or even for this house. The Devil Within is a Cavalry Audio production, written and directed by Brandon Morgan. Original score by Monkey Mind Music Group. Original music by Bruce Whitkin. Executive produced by Keegan Rosenberger and Dana Brunetti. For Cavalry Audio, I'm Brandon Morgan. Brandon Morgan.